passage that I'm reading from is taken from an article that was printed in the Signs of the Times on the 17th of uh, December, 1885. Fair time back, right? 1885. It says the following. Many profess to come to Christ while they yet cling to their own ways, which are a painful yoke. Selfish, selfishness, covetousness, ambition, and love of the world, or some other cherished sin, destroys their peace and joy. They are restless, impatient, dissatisfied, and their spirits chafe under the weight of care and responsibility, all because they have not made a complete surrender to Jesus and are seeking to carry their burden without his aid. If he were by their side, the sunshine of his presence would scatter every cloud. The help of his strong arm would lighten every burden. I want to ask you this morning where your Christian experience is. I want to ask you to consider this morning whether you fall into this category of professing Christian. Do you find that your experience is one of restlessness, of impatience, of dissatisfaction? Does your spirit chafe under the weight of care? When the reality is that God desires for you to experience something much more positive. Last time that I brought a message here, I uh, mentioned that uh, the challenge that we have in Christianity today that I have found in my own experience is that we have settled for a vision that this is all that there is. That our current spiritual experience, that our, our lack of intimacy with God, that our, we've almost become satisfied with guessing at His will. We don't have the confidence to say, the Lord has directed my path. The Lord has instructed this or that or the next thing. Now I know that there is also a phenomenon on the other end of the spectrum where everything is said by God and it's nothing more than one's own desires. I'm assuming for a moment that we are not talking about that extreme. Should Christians experience a vacant quietness from heaven? Or should there be a real experience in our daily walk? Should you go down on your knees and pray a prayer that doesn't feel as if it's bouncing off the ceiling? Sorry, it feels as if it is bouncing off the ceiling. Not going any higher. Or should there be a vitality in our prayer experience? Now, I'm not, again, to warn you about the other extreme, I'm not advocating a religion of feeling. There are times, to be sure, when we are tempted and harassed, when it does feel like maybe no one's listening. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this experience that I found, found myself so easily given over to. The experience of just an ongoing sense of disconnect from God. Going through the motions, going through the routines, reading the Bible, perhaps even praying, and just not really getting connected with God. It brings me to the promise in the word in 1 John 1 verse 9 where it says... That if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Now this is an amazing promise to me because I've been thinking about my Christian experience. And the Lord has been taking me on an interesting yet I must say painful journey as of late. Painful journey. Sometimes we have this idea that Christianity is all about the roses. It's all about the good feelings. And to be sure, through the forgiveness of Christ, there is that experience. But before you get to that experience, there is often a path of painful introspection that the Spirit leads you through. 
A weighing of your character and of your motives and of your intents and of the thoughts of your heart against that law of God which brings condemnation. You see, you and I cannot begin to experience the value of the cross. We cannot begin to understand the magnitude of what has been offered to us. We cannot receive it as good news until you understand your desperate need for it. This idea in the world that guilt is a bad thing, that guilt leads to bad things, that guilt is what results in people becoming depressed and anxious and suicidal and all the rest. This idea that guilt is the enemy is a fallacy. Guilt is not the enemy. Guilt is the tool in the hand of God to lead you to a place of healing and restoration. What is the enemy is when guilt is not dealt with biblically. When that guilt is allowed to remain in our hearts and upon our minds, when we are weighed down by that guilt because we cannot get rid of it, either because we do not know about confession to God or because we will not surrender it to God, it is then that that guilt becomes like a cancer of the spiritual soul and it begins eating us away from the inside. And undealt with, yes, that guilt will lead to our demise. But it is not guilt that is the problem. It is the failure to take the medicine that is offered by the great physician. The world of psychology would have you live in a place of blissful denial of any sense of guilt of any sense of wrongdoing. It is explained away as mere choice and relativism and relativity. What's good for you is good for you. Your sexual orientation, the way you think about things, your desires. Embrace them, is the teaching. Embrace them and learn to live with them. Make them work for you. And this is the very means that God is appointing The sense of guilt to drive us in search of a cure. Challenge you this morning. What is your Christian experience like? Do you live in the experience and in the joy of sins forgiven? Or, like many, are you seeking rather to deal with guilt your own way? Live in denial of your guilt. Try and embrace, try and absorb an unwillingness to relinquish, to surrender the guilt and the practice to God. Because the good news is that if we confess our sin, if we hand it to God, the promise is that He will forgive That he is faithful, that he is just. And I pondered over that phrase for some time, many years back, and I began to wonder, why does it say that he is faithful and just? Okay, the faithful part I get. After all, when we confess our sins, he is faithful. That means the moment I confess my sin, the only variableness is on my side as to whether I will give it to him, but his faithfulness demands that the moment I have given it to him, he acts on it through forgiveness. The faithfulness I can grasp, but what is this just? Why does it say he is faithful and And he is just to forgive us our sins. What does justice, what does his just character have to do with the concept of forgiveness? And suddenly it dawned on me that at the cross, righteousness and mercy kissed one another. Suddenly it dawned on my understanding that at the cross, it is not only the faithfulness of God that hangs him upon the tree, but it is the justice of God that insists he drink the cup to the full. He is not only faithful in bearing our sin, loyal to us as a human race despite our unfaithfulness to Him. He is not only the one who will not be turned aside from His loyalty to us, but He is also the one that deals with the problem in a way that meets the just requirement. In other words, when He forgives you, it is fair for Him to do so. He has not simply ignored the problem, turned a blind eye to his favorites in the class. He's not just making as if it doesn't exist or sweeping it under the rug, so to speak. But when he forgives you, it is just and it is fair because the righteous requirement of the law has been met in the dying person of Jesus. That law which demanded the death of the transgressor has received the death of the almighty God, the one whose character and being is on a par with the law, for that law is a description of his own character. 
God has taken upon the cross. He has taken the punishment of sin onto his own being. You see, this is what, this is, what is amazing to me about the plan of salvation. He doesn't just choose to ignore the problem. But he receives into his own being your rebellion, your sin, your waywardness. Every sin you have committed, every sin you will yet future commit, was borne by Christ Jesus on the cross that day. Every sin he made full atonement for, past, present, future, covered in that once and for all sacrifice. That atoning sacrifice complete for every sinner, every person. Regardless of whether you accept it or not, regardless of whether you confess your sin or not, he bore it. He paid for it. So that when the sinner comes to him and casts their sin, their bundle of sin being borne on their shoulders in their own strength, causing them guilt, causing them pain, causing them gloominess, causing them isolation, causing them withdrawal. From society, unable to enter into the fullness of mature, loving, vulnerable relationships. Always carrying that sense of guilt. When they cast that burden off of their shoulders at the foot of the cross, he says, it is dealt with by my faithfulness and by my fairness, so there is no way it can ever come back to you. In the divine audit of the heavenly judgment, when it is examined as whether it is fair to forgive you or not, it will be seen that God is not only faithful to you, not only loyal to you, for your salvation. But the way that he has done it has been absolutely within the keepings of the principle of justice. Because the consequence of sin has indeed been borne by one greater than you. Intrinsically sinless. But taking your place. The demands of the law were met. So when you confess your sin. He is not only faithful, but he truly is just. He is, in other words, entitled to forgive you. There's a nice word. Entitled. In a world where entitlement is the order of the day. You owe me. The government owes me. Everybody owes me that sense of entitlement. Well, God has a sense of entitlement to forgive you. Because he paid the price. It is within his Right to forgive you. He is entitled to forgive you. He is faithful. And he is just to forgive you. But the verse doesn't end there, does it? He wants to do a lot more than that. And he is entitled to do a lot more than that. He has the right not only to forgive you by virtue of what happened at the cross... By taking your sin, dying in your place. But he not only forgives you, but cleanses you of all unrighteousness. This verse contains everything you need to know in seed form. About what it means to be a saved Christian. The good news is that he does more than roll away your guilt. The good news is that after having rolled away your guilt, he says to you, here is a spirit of empowerment. I want not only to forgive you, to write acquitted next to your name, and leave you in the place of helplessness, and leave you in the place of despondency, and leave you in the place of, of, of being unable to live a godly life such that you are constantly compelled to come here on your knees all the time. But I want to do more than forgive you. I want to bless you with the heart that Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden before they sinned. I want to bless you with a love for righteousness. I want to bless you with the same loyalty I have for you. You would have that loyalty to me. I want to bless you not only with acquittal or forgiveness. I want to bless you with a new life. A practical reality. Something that you take with you beyond the hour of prayer and confession. To cleanse you 
of all unrighteousness. Now, I've gone over an interesting journey when it comes to this issue of sin on confession. Listen to this interesting statement, Christ's Object Lessons. It says that the righteousness of Christ will not cover one cherished sin. Oh, Adrian, yeah, you go. This is the part where we all get very uncomfortable. What is he going to say next? What theological direction is this pastor steering us in here? Those of you that have been in Adventism for a little while will know kind of what I'm hinting at there. But listen to this inspired counsel. The righteousness of Christ will not cover one cherished sin. What do you do with statements like that? Anybody reached sinlessness here this morning? I think I should maybe put my hand down too. One cherished sin. The key to understanding that phrase is the word cherished. Cherished. What does it mean to cherish? It means you love. It means you adore. It means you are loyal to. It means you cling to. It means you will not give it up. It means you do not want his help. It means I like it, period. Hands off, Lord Jesus. 99% you can have, but this thing, no. I like this thing. The righteousness of Christ will not cover one of those types of sin called cherished sins. Those sins that you are not willing to let go of, those sins that you are not willing to confess, those sins that you are not willing to relinquish. A man may be a lawbreaker in heart, yet if he commits no outward act of transgression, he may be regarded by the world as possessing great integrity. You see, because we only see what's on the outside. So if you're not outwardly committing something which we can see, we might regard you by human appearances as being A-OK, eldership material. Get what I'm saying? But, but God's law looks into the secrets of the heart. Every act is judged by the motives that prompt it. Did you get that? Every act is judged how? By the fruit that it bears? No, not necessarily. Every act is judged how? By the motives that prompted it. In other words, I may be able to return great offerings to the Lord. I may like the fact that I'm able to return to the Lord great sums of money. And I may even like for others to see that and recognize that. What has just happened to my motivation? Who's it all about? Who's the giving in aid of? Is it an act of worship out of gratefulness for what the Lord has done? Or is it a way of self-exaltation? Self-exaltation. Which means you've done the right thing outwardly, returning the tithes and the offerings. But God judges it as sinful. Because the motives that prompted it were impure, impure and tarnished with self. It's a bit of an uncomfortable sermon today, isn't it? But I've been challenged by the Lord in my own experience to say, Adrian, you're tired of me mediocrity, right? You come to me on your knees and you say, Lord, do amazing things. You come to me and you beg me, Adrian, saying... Do something amazing. You come to me and you say, Adrian, I want an adventure in your grace. And the Lord's asking me, are you ready to let go of self? Because until self is let go of, there is no adventure. Until self is let go of, there is no radical, amazing stuff that's going to happen. Until self is let go of in the remnant church of God, the work will not be finished. At least not by us, not by this generation. I've been personally challenged by this. Only that which is in accord with the principles of God's law will stand in the judgment. 
She writes an interesting article in the Review and Herald, and I just listen to the title of this. It says, The Example of Judas. <laughs> the Example of Judas. What can you and I learn from Judas? A whole lot. She says, Who of us are copying the true pattern? Through the grace of Christ, are we mastering pride of heart? Have we uprooted selfishness? Have we opened wide the door of the heart to let in the precious love of Jesus? Or are we cherishing sins that will ruin us at last? We cannot meet Christ in peace with one sin unrepented of, unconfessed, unforsaken. We cannot meet Christ in peace with one sin unrepented of, unconfessed and unforsaken. Now you've heard forgiveness preached as a soothing balm to the soul. And so it is. But for you to receive that soothing balm, for you to know the liberation that comes from forgiveness, you need to understand how desperately you need it. The preacher needs to understand how desperately he needs it. You need to understand that there is sufficient grace in the blood of Jesus, in the justice of his character, and in the loyalty and the mercy that he has towards you to provide your forgiveness. But that promise began with the word, if. What do you know about the word, if? Small but important. The word, if, indicates condition, doesn't it? We'll go out to the park today, Gabriella, if you eat all your lunch. Right? You see, what this promise is saying is that you and I can rest assured that there is no sin that cannot be covered. You and I can rest assured that there is sufficient loyalty on the side of God to ensure that what is confessed to Him will be forgiven... There is sufficient justice in the character of God that there will be no comebacks. There is sufficient power in the blood of Christ to do more than forgive you. He will also cleanse you and empower you, give you a new heart, a new life, new motivation stemming from within. A transformation that is not forced from the outside like a cloak covering filthiness and corruption on the inside, but that the cleansing of the blood of Jesus not only acquits you, that there is sufficient power that you and I will be truly transformed from the inside so that it begins to happen naturally, so the outward actions, the outward words, the attitudes of our hearts are genuinely motivated by something that has changed on the inside. That is the difference between Christianity and all other false religions of works. In all other religions, you are trying through the external control, through the power of your own mind, through positive thinking or whatever it is, to transform your behavior in the hopes that by doing that, it will change who you are on the inside. But it will never succeed. Christianity stands alone in the world of religions as saying, no, you cannot do it. First, there must be a change of principle on the inside. It will work its way out in a transformation of behavior and lifestyle. And that's why we always say that our works, we do not do them to be saved, but they are a result of being saved. When I go down on my knees and I confess my sin, acquittal is written next to my name. And if it is the genuine article, something takes place on the inside so that I'm not only forgiven, but I am transformed, cleansed of all unrighteousness. The result is that I get up from my knees with the Spirit of God as my aid, with the angels beside me to guide me, to strengthen me, to warn me, to encourage me. There is a transformation, a change of principle on the inside that overalls the outside. Now the challenge is this. In, within the church, there are two groups of people. And both may be appearing to act on the outside in the same way. Both may give assent to the doctrines of truth, persuaded by their coherency, persuaded by the beauty of truth. But one is not living a, a life of genuine power, of true conversion. 
One is living a life of the forced externals, trying to bring myself into subjection to these behaviors, this way of living, in the hopes that God will accept me, in the hopes that I will experience transformation. Doomed to failure. There's another group looks the same. Looks the same, doing the same things, paying the same tithe, returning to God, the same act of obedience. But it's coming forth as a fruit from an internal transformation. How do you know which group you are? Because if you are a self-respecting Seventh-day Adventist this morning, you are going to be looking like a Seventh-day Adventist. How do you test for yourself and know which group you are? And the key to it was in that opening paragraph. You see, you may be able to fool me, fool the elders and the deacons. You may be able to fool your husband, your wife, or even your children by the correctness of your outward deportment, how you carry yourself. But you alone know in the quiet recesses of your mind whether you are connected to God or not. Let me put it this way. If you question whether you are, that's probably a good indicator. Because when you are, you will know the experience. Follow what I'm saying? Or let me spell it out further. Go back to that quote. Are these the hallmarks of your experience? Is this what your Christian experience is like? Like restlessness, impatience. You know, the sense of, you know, I'm a little bit bored with this. What, what, what can I do? What can I fill my time? You know, I don't, you know, there's just not that sense of connectedness. Restlessness, impatience, dissatisfaction, spirits chafing under the weight of care and responsibility. Why? Because it gives us the cure. They have not made a complete surrender to Jesus. One sin, unrepented of, unconfessed, unforsaken. You see, there is, there is a condition to the forgiveness of God. Now it is not a condition of work. So don't even go down that theological road with me. It's the condition of confession. I like the way in the spirit of prophecy there. It's, it's equated a few words. That so you can understand this better. What is this confession? Because again there's another misunderstanding. You know it's like this idea that. You know if there's anything that I, I haven't been able to remember. From the day I was two. That I didn't specifically confess. That thing can't be covered. Now that's not what this is referring to. When you receive Jesus and you confess to God, it is the equivalent of forsaking, the equivalent of repenting, the equivalent of surrendering. You see, true confession is the act of surrender. So when we say there is a condition to forgiveness, it is not a condition of works. You do not flagellate yourself, whipping yourself, climb up the highest mountain, inflict pain on yourself, give greater offerings. That would be works to earn the favor of God, to show him and prove that I am worthy of his forgiveness, that I'm so sorry for what I've done. No, 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 no. That's not the condition. The condition is that you surrender it to God unreservedly, committedly. It's yours. I'm done with it. In other words, I don't want anything more to do with it. That's what real confession is. Real confession is not. Real confession is not. Lord, X, Y, Z, this is what I've done. Please forgive me. You know I'm going to do it tomorrow. You get what I'm saying? Lord, please forgive me. I've just done this thing, but my intention really is to continue tomorrow. See, that is not confession. That's an insult to the intelligence of God. Confession is the act whereby you and I Surrender to God our sin. Surrender it. Let me illustrate it to you this way from the world of human relationships. You have met people that are always saying sorry for the same thing. Right? And they are sorry because 
They know that they've incurred your disfavor. Maybe you're not benefiting them anymore, not giving them money anymore. I don't know what it may be. You, you look at your own experience. You know what it's like. You can discern when somebody is genuinely saying sorry with no ulterior motives. They only want to get it off their chest, acknowledge their wrongdoing because they perceive that it has hurt you. It is hurting them. They want it removed. They want the barrier taken away. They want your relationship back. They don't just want your stuff. They don't just want your favors. They want you back in their life. That is true confession, right? But you all too well know from your own world of relationships, that you get another class of person. They're not interested in you or your relationship. They come to you to say sorry because somehow, through what they've done, they have hurt themselves, disadvantaged themselves. Uh, am, I, am I making sense to you? Are you sort of following what I'm saying? When you confess to God, what is it that motivates your confession? Do you desire a restoration of the relationship? Or do you simply desire an escape of some temporal consequence or even hellfire one day? Do you confess because you want the benefits of God, but you still want to cling to the old way of life? Because that kind of confession does not meet the condition. If we confess our sins. It is really, at the end of the day, such a simple, simple condition, isn't it? But what God is looking at in the act of confession is where is the heart in the experience? Where is the heart? Now, let me warn you off another danger so that there's no misunderstanding here. We recognize weaknesses of the flesh. And I do not believe that you bounce in and out of salvation. I go down on my knees, I say, sorry, I'm getting up. And as I get up, I bang my knee on the sharp corner of the desk and something happens and I slip out with a bad word. Whoops, now I'm out of salvation again. Get down on my knees like a tennis match, backwards and forwards, in and out of salvation. No, that's not what we're talking about. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. The other night I go to bed. I go to bed and I can't fall asleep. I can't fall asleep because as I'm lying there in bed, my mind will not stop. Because I know that feeling when the Spirit of God is saying, Adrian, you need to talk to me tonight before you go to sleep. Now, I don't just mean a casual conversation. Adrian, you know that there's something we need to talk about. So I engage in prayer. Lying in my bed, I engage in prayer. And I'm talking to God about this. And I'm talking to God about that. And I'm talking to God about other people. And I'm praying to God about ministry, but all the time there is that thing, that sense of discomfort, that sense of you're not getting down to what you know you need to talk to me about, Adrian. You know what it's like when you visit someone. You've got a burden on your heart. You know there's an issue that they are in denial of, skirting around. Everything's always just, hi, how are you? It's fine. Everything's great. But you know that their heart is burdened. You know that they're, they're, the life forces are being wearied away. And you're listening and you're waiting and you're hoping that they will open their heart to you. You know what it's like when you've done something wrong against a friend and you're visiting with them and everybody knows what's going on, but no one's saying anything. Does that make sense to you? You know that there's something you should be saying, there's something, but it's all small talk, it's all chit chat. How much of our prayer life is spent like that with God? Small things, chit chat, maybe even important things, but it's not what you are in need of most. You see, here's the dialogue that was going on in my own mind while I'm at the same time talking to God. There are these thoughts that are flying around in my, own heart, in my own mind. And my own ethical constraints are saying to me, Adrian, you really can't raise this issue. You really can't talk to God about this thing. I'm dialoguing with myself. You, know? you can't talk to him because he's not a fool. And Adrian, you know that you're planning this thing again. You know you're going to engage in this thing again. Adrian, how can you... You know the world of theology. You understand the promises. How can you even dare to say to God, 
I'm sorry about this. Yes, it's incurring me guilt. Yes, I can feel it's weighing me down. Yes, I know it's getting in the way. Yes, I know it's diverting time and energy and resources away from this intimate communion with God. But how can I say sorry to God when I know I still love this thing and I still want this thing? Didn't know the pastor had those kind of struggles, did you? How much of our intimacy with God is lost because you and I, you and I do not confess our sins in the fullest sense of the word. How many of you and I confess in the sense of, Lord, I've incurred some guilt. I need restoration of this relationship. Uh, Probably in about 12 to 24 hours, I'll probably be doing it again. You know that in your heart, but you're saying, Lord, forgive me this time. Now, I know that there is a struggle with self to be one, and I know that that struggle is strong. And I know that there are times when we fall more than once in a certain area of sin. I am not trying to make out like that doesn't happen and that there's no forgiveness for that. But it comes down to the motivation of the heart. Is the confession genuine? Is there real willingness, in other words, not only to find acquittal, but to be free of this enslavement? And I was so sick and tired of going around that mulberry bush with the Lord. So sick and tired of me knowing there's something I need to say to Him. But being unable to because I also know that I like this thing. And I was so sick and tired of the mediocrity of my own personal spiritual experience. Because there's no real connection when that happens. There's no real peace that flows. It's always just skirting around the edges of spirituality. You know, it's always just, like I say, sitting in that room with that someone who you know you need to say something to, but you really don't want to. You really just try and avoid it and gloss over it. So sick and tired, Adrian, of that kind of experience with your God. That finally, lying in my bed that night, I said to the Lord, We have gone around this thing for long enough. You know I love this thing. You know I enjoy this thing. But I also know that you have called on me to give it up. My God, take it from me. Forgive me. I don't want to go back there anymore. And suddenly that sense of disconnectedness disappeared. And that sense of rest and the ability to close my eyes and sleep and know that if a torrential downpour came that night and a tree fell on my bedroom and it squished me in my sleep and I never opened my eyes again to this temporal life, it's all good. It's okay. And that is the best feeling you will ever know. That is the place of liberation. That is the place of release. That is a place when you begin to sing with your heart those words that have been penned by, the, by, by, by those who wrote those age-old hymns years and years ago, men of deep Christian piety and experience. Men like the apostles in the New Testament That's the place where you begin to realize that there is actually power over my sin. That there is actually an internal transformation that comes about. That I don't have to live my life in this tennis match backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. But that there is a real release and a transformation that comes to to be. I want to ask you this morning. When last you experienced confession? When last you knew your acceptance with God 
And that though there were sure to be things in the future that he was going to talk to you about, that at this moment and at this point in my journey, given my length of years, given my knowledge, given my privileges, which is not the same for any one of us, so I cannot stand in judgment of any one of us, but given your experience, the light that you've had shining on your path, have you, when last have you, had that experience where you know that you are accepted with God. I would dare to venture that just like me, there are secret places in your heart and in your lifestyle. And I hope I'm completely wrong about that. But this is what I've come to understand as the necessary preparation to meet the Lord in the clouds of heaven. The necessary preparation that you and I must acquire before that time of trouble comes upon this world such as never before. This preparation of a complete and absolute surrender to God at every stage of your Christian development. That right now, where you are, with the light that has shone on your road... The truth that you've been exposed to, the knowledge that you have, and the conviction that the Spirit has laid upon you, that those things are given to God. You know, when you fail to do that, you stagnate. That's why I believe this remnant church, and why so many of you might be able to relate to this guy behind the desk, when I say that I'm tired of a spirit of spiritual mediocrity. Tired of being a lame offering and sacrifice. Tired of just wandering around in this world of spirituality, kind of just waiting for the day that Jesus comes back in the hopes that then I will know real intimacy with him. What is it that holds us back from that experience? The failure to surrender. The failure to confess At every stage of our development, the things that God is calling you to surrender that day. You will stay there and go around in circles and become bored with your experience until one day you say to God in all earnestness of spirit, in all genuineness, in all honesty of heart, God have mercy upon me a sinner. I am weak. Help mine unbelief. Help me, I pray thee. Forgive me and cleanse me. Of this unrighteousness. And tomorrow there may be another such thing. At every stage of your development. You have the assurance. He is faithful. He is just. He has all power at his disposal. There is no variableness with him. But there is a condition. A variableness on the part of his professed follower. Have you confessed? Have you surrendered? Are you right with your God this morning? In closing, I want to give you an opportunity. Not only hopefully to have experienced conviction on the subject by the Spirit of God. But to surrender. To confess. I want to give you an opportunity to go down on your knees. And to talk to God one on one, quietly, to confess that which he has been speaking to you about. But perhaps you have been holding on to it for far too long. The theme for this quinquennium of the general conference is revival and reformation. There is no revival. There is no reformation. Until sins are confessed and forgiveness is received and the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus takes place. So I invite you where possible to slip to your knees and just talk to the Lord this morning.
Thank you for the assurance of your acceptance. Like Israel of old, like Daniel the prophet, we must confess that we are rebellious in a way with people. There is too much, Lord, in our lives and in our homes. Too much of the love of the world. Too much of its principles of action. Too much, too much of its ethics and way of doing things. But there is a higher experience that you have called us to. An experience which we have been slow to grasp the vision of. Let alone comply with. Will you breathe life into our souls this morning, Lord, even as you did for Adam in the Garden of Eden? Will you cause your spirit to blow upon us? That we may know freedom from guilt. And the joy of salvation. Will you implant within us a heart of flesh with motivations that are received from the throne of grace. May we see the world around us differently. May we respond to our challenges differently. May our spiritual lives be born from within instead of forced from without. Will you give to us this morning, Lord, a knowledge of sins forgiven? Will you receive us again as your children and as your sons and daughters, heirs of the heavenly kingdom? Lord Jesus, thank you for the gift of Calvary. Thank you for the assurance of your faithfulness and of your justice in your dealings with us and in the provision of this great gift of forgiveness. All to Jesus we surrender. All to him we freely give is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
Heavenly Father, as we go from this place, may we go with your countenance shining upon us, with your smile radiating your peace to us, the joy and the knowledge of sins forgiven. In Jesus' name.